Still in chapter 1, if you don't have your uh, Bible with you, or if you don't have a Bible and you'd like to follow along with us, grab one of the, the Bibles that's in the chair rack in front of you. And if you don't know where to find 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you should be able to find that on page 952 of the Bibles that are there in our chair racks. I recently heard a story from a woman by the name of Elna Baker. She is a writer, she is a comedian, she is a radio producer. And one of the interesting things about Elna Baker's life is that uh, several years ago, she decided that she was going to, she was overweight and she was going to lose a lot of weight. And so she went to a medical weight loss uh, clinic for help with this, and she lost 110 pounds in about five and a half months, which I don't know if that's even safe. <laughs> but she lost uh, a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And one of the things that she does now is she tells stories about what life was like uh, before and what life is now like after. And one of the things that she talks about is that soon after she, she'd been trying and trying out of college to get a job in the entertainment industry in some way. And after she lost this weight, she was able to get an entry-level position at The Late Show with David Letterman. And her first day on the job, she was given some training about what it was that she was going to be doing uh, for the Letterman Show. And what her job was is to walk down the line of people that had purchased tickets and were waiting to get into the theater that for the show's taping. Her job was to walk down that line and divide the people with tickets who were waiting in that line into three groups. And here are the groups that she was supposed to divide them into. The first group were the dots. She would mark everybody's ticket accordingly. The first group were the dots. The dots were the beautiful people. The dots got seated on the first three rows of the show. And the, the fir, because the first three rows of the show were the, 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 mostly the, the rows that would be caught on camera. The next group of people were the generals. Generals were average-looking people. Those people were seated after row three in the order that they came. The third group of people that she would mark on their tickets were called CBS twos. CBS twos were people that they didn't want anywhere near the camera. They were the people that were considered overweight, Elderly people that had some sort of visible physical problem, and interestingly enough, goths. <laughs> the CBS 2s got seated in the upper rows of the balcony. And that was her job as she worked for The Late Show, to every day go through the, the line of people that were waiting and divide them into those three groups. The first day that she was trained for the job, Baker came to a sort of epiphany. She had attended a taping of The Late Show several years before she had lost the weight. And she had wondered why, even though she was at the very beginning of the line, she had got seated in the nosebleed section. Once she started working for The Late Show, she realized why. This world values dots. The beautiful people the strong people, the intelligent people, the wealthy people. Dots are the kinds of people that we want on our promotional materials, right? When you're creating a brand to sell a product or you have a cause that you want to call people to, who are you going to put on your promotional materials? Are you going to put pictures of the people who will actually be using the product? Of course not. You're going to put pictures of people who are beautiful because beauty sells. 
We want to put on our promotional materials people who look like they are successful because if people are going to be attracted to join our cause or buy our product, we want them to identify in some way wealth and beauty and intelligence and success with our brand or with our cause. But as we're going to see this morning, the gospel message, the message of the cross, is profoundly counter-cultural. The message of the gospel does not give a special place, a special privilege to the dots over the CBS 2s. In fact, the gospel flourishes among generals and CBS 2s. The gospel message has not, does not, and will not ever spread because Christians are beautiful brand ambassadors. It spreads because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to every single person who believes it. And we're in a series through the book of 1 Corinthians, which we have entitled, Come Together. And one of the Apostle Paul who wrote this, this is originally a letter written to a church. One of the reasons the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians was he was concerned that they were not coming together, that they were in fact splintering apart. There are seven obstacles to unity in this book, which we are going to be considering as we study it. And the first obstacle to unity is polarizing personalities. This, is, this obstacle is found in chapters 1 through 4. And what was happening in their church, and what often happens in churches like ours, is that different factions in the church were organized, not so much visibly, but there were undercurrents of dividing into various groups oriented around people favorite leader or teacher. Paul writes this letter and pleads with them to, instead of being polarized or unified around their favorite teacher or leader, to be unified instead around the cross. The cross was to be their rallying point. But we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it about the cross that makes it a unifying rallying point? And the answers to that question are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 2 and verse 5. And I summarized the general big idea or message of that section this way. The cross creates unity by calling us to humility. The cross creates unity by calling us to humility. So what is it about the cross that calls us to humility? Well, the answer that we looked at, the first answer that we looked at first two, uh, two weeks ago is this. The message of the cross calls us to humility. The very message itself calls us to humility. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, the Bible says. The message of the cross is not celebrated by the intellectual elite, if that's a newsflash to any of you. And one of the reasons that the message of the cross is not celebrated by the intellectual elite is because it tells us that we are helpless to save ourselves or we are helpless to decide what it means to even be saved in the first place or what we need to be saved from. The message of the cross tells us that truth is not something that each one of us gets to construct based on our own preferences. Truth is not something, ultimate truth, is not even something that we can arrive at on our own. God refuses to submit himself to our own ideas of what makes rational sense. Which is not to say that God is irrational, but to say that the message of the cross is one that must be received by faith. And if you receive something by faith, that's humbling. Because you don't get to decide what truth is. But the Bible says, as we saw two weeks ago, that to those who are being saved by the cross, the message of Christ crucified is the power of God. So the very message of the cross calls us to humility. But I want to see, this, to see in the second place this week that the followers of the cross call us 
to humility. The followers of the cross call us to humility. We can see this in verses 26 through 31 of chapter 1. Let's read those verses together. The Bible says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, that's God, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now these verses that we just read together describe the kinds of people that God calls. The reason God calls those particular kinds of people and the purpose to which God has called them. So let's start by talking about the people God calls in verse 26. The kinds of people God calls. Paul asked the Corinthian believers to stop for a moment and consider their calling. He says, consider your calling, brothers. And he tells them to consider their calling because it's a, kind of a subtle way of reminding them that they are not Christians because they're smarter than everyone else. You're not Christians because you're one of the, the, the chosen few who gets it when the rest of the world doesn't. When Paul invites them to consider their calling, he's reminding them that the very fact that they are Christians is not due to themselves, but due to the work of God in them. Now this concept of calling has been, has been uh, a thread all throughout this first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Verse 2. He begins by telling them that they have been called to be saints. And remember, saints aren't a special class of super holy people. Saints is another Bible word for Christian. So he says in verse 2 that they've been called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, you, if you're there, you can look at verse 9. He promises them in verse 9 that the reason they will be sustained guiltless to the end is because God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Then, look at verse 24. The Bible says, To those who are called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, I've said before that the language of God's calling in Scripture is the language of a divine summons, not a suggestion. So when you get a court summons, the court is not asking you if you would like to show up for jury duty, if it fits your schedule. If you have some sort of uh, court summons, they're not telling you that there's a spot available for you today if you would like to take it. When you receive a court summons, it is a demand for you to go. And that's similar to what God's call is like. But God's call is even stronger than that. It's sometimes referred to by theologians, I said, as the effectual call. It is effective, and it is effective because it accomplishes what it asks. It accomplishes what it asks. Of course, that doesn't mean that there no, wasn't a day in your life where the light came on in your heart, in your mind, and you realized that the gospel was true for the first time, or maybe you heard the gospel for the first time and you believed. Maybe you were wrestling with the gospel for a long time because you did not want to bow your knee to King Jesus. There is all sorts of human action in our calling on the name of the Lord to be saved, but what Paul is saying is that behind your actions were the actions of an almighty God. God calling you, pulling you inevitably to himself so that you arrived. He says, remember your calling, brothers. 
You're not here because you came on your own. So just bring it down a couple notches. You're here because for some reason, God decided to show mercy to you. We believe because we've been called. And so Paul asks them, and through the Spirit asks us, to take a realistic look at their church. And we're to take a realistic look at our church and consider who they are. Who they were, the kinds of people, the the makeup of their church. And he mentions three different categories of people. He says, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. He's telling us that in the eyes of the world, we are not exactly the intellectual elite. Or to put it in another way, When you look at our church, we might not be described as the sharpest knives in the drawer. By human standards, not many of us would be considered brilliant. I can certainly attest to that as my family can as well. There weren't a lot of PhDs in their congregation. We're ours. There weren't a lot of people in their church or in our church that could go to the nearest university and engage a philosophy professor in some of the finer points of Kant or Hegel or Plato or Nietzsche or any of the other philosophers that have walked this earth. In the world's eyes, you just aren't that wise. At least not many are. He then says, not many were powerful. He's not referring here primarily to physical strength, to be able to bench press at or above your own body weight. He's talking about people of influence. If you looked out of the congregation, not many of you are people of influence. You are not the power brokers, the politicians, or the policy makers of the world. Not most of us in our congregation are not the people shaping the worldwide geopolitical uh, stage, unless some of you have a totally different life that I did not know about. And if you do, awesome. <laughs> Keep shaping the geopolitical stage. <laughs> But not many of us have that sort of political worldwide influence. And frankly, we're not even influential in just culturally speaking. You know, there are are people called social media influencers. Brands pay big money to social media influencers to place their product in their Instagram post or their YouTube video. As I was reading an article about this several weeks ago, I, I'm, I'm fairly cynical when it comes to things like that, but I was still shocked. There, there are people on, on Instagram that they get like $50,000 just to put a can of a drink with the label side out somewhere in their video or in their Instagram shot. In fact, there's, there's all kinds of tiers of pricing. Like for every 100,000 followers you have, it's $1,000 for a product placement. So there are people who are making a ton of money off of this. Kylie Jenner makes $1 million per Instagram picture just to put a product in it. I mean, I have an Instagram. Of, Somebody give me a million dollars just to put a... I'll put whatever you want in that picture. (laughs) To my 45 followers. (laughs) She's got 129 million, so she's got me by a few. But, you know, I'm watching a lot of basketball this weekend because there's this big tournament going on and Coke has launched this orange vanilla Coke, which seems a little weird to me, but I'm willing to try it. (laughs) But I'm willing to guess that Coke has not reached out to anybody in this room and said, hey, next time you do an Instagram post of your lunch, will you uh, turn the label of the orange vanilla Coke? Do you know why Coke hasn't reached out to any of you? Because you don't matter to them. 
You're not influential. You're not going to convince more than two other people to buy orange vanilla Coke. And I'm not either. There's a third category of people here. Not many were of noble birth. What he's pointing out here is that not many of the congregation or ours were our blue bloods, the upper crust, the royal family, born into a well-connected, well-known, powerful family. Now, let me be clear. The Bible is not saying that God is against the intellectual elite, that God is against people of influence, that God is against people who are born into uh, special families that are well-connected and have all sorts of privileges and opportunities that the rest of us don't have. God calls people like that too. So he's not against any of those kinds of people. Selena Hastings is the Countess of Huntingdon in England in the 1700s. She came to faith when she was in her 30s. She was a very wealthy woman, a very well-connected woman. She was personal friends with people like John Wesley and George Whitfield. Augustus Toplady, isn't that the uh, person who wrote Rock of Ages? Um, uh, she was friends. These are all her friends. She was an influential supporter of Christian ministry in England because of her wealth and influence. She brought George Whitfield in to preach to the aristocracy because she was well-connected. She started a college to train ministers because she had lots of money. She built over 60 church buildings in her lifetime with her money Support the work of the ministry because she was a wealthy, influential woman. Well, one of the things that, that she would always say that she was fond of saying is that she was saved by the letter M. Because the Bible says, doesn't say not any noble, not any of noble birth, not many of noble birth. And so God saves all kinds of people everywhere. But the church, the bigger, broader point is, the church isn't much to look at from the world's perspective. Okay, and I don't mean that as any disrespect to any of you. I love all of you. But you're not much to look at. <laughs> I mean, if you want to pick, like, what's going to move Christianity forward for the next two centuries, you're probably not going to pick us. And God is constantly calling people who aren't much to look at. People like me. People like you. And not in this romantic way, because there's this, this theme for, for a lot, oftentimes kids, kids' movies where there's the island of misfit toys, or there's, the, there's the, always the character in these animated movies that doesn't fit in anywhere, they're, they're, there's some sort of problem with them, and they're kind of ostracized by the rest of the group, but they turn out to save everyone, and everyone turns out to like them, and they have all of these qualities, and they're all celebrated because of their flaws and everything turns out awesome. Well, that's not what the Bible is telling us here. It's telling us that God saves a lot of people who are down and out or people who are insignificant or who don't mean much. And it doesn't mean that, that once he saves them, they become something. They're still insignificant. They're still looked down on. They still don't look like much to the world. We're not social media influencers or the people that you put on the front of a brochure, but we are exactly the kinds of people God calls. Now I want to see the reason God calls people like that. In verses 27 to 29. Why does God call these particular kinds of people to put their faith in Jesus and to experience the saving power of the cross? Well, the first part of that answer is found beginning in verse 27. It says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low... 
despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Now, a word that you could substitute in here to help you understand what it means for God to shame something is disgrace. A man by the name of D.A. Carson says this of this passage, where proud men and women parade their mighty intellects, God chooses the simple. Where wealthy people assess each other on the basis of their respective holdings, God chooses the poor. Where self-centered leaders lust for power, God chooses the nobodies. Now this would have been particularly important in a culture like Corinth because in Corinth, one of the worst things that could possibly happen to you is to have your status lowered. Remember, this is an upwardly mobile society in many ways. Not like our society, but for the society of the time it certainly was. There was some, gap, there was some ability to rise in class. This is a place where sla freed slaves can come to become merchants and make their fortune. So people are constantly trying to move up. They're trying to increase their status in the community. There are patrons who are paying to have things made or statues put up or whatever it is to show that they're a person who matters in Corinth. These, this desire for reputation is just as strong in our culture today. I mean, we've got... PR firms whose job is to manage the reputations of brands and individuals. When a scandal hits a brand or a well-known person, what's the first thing they do? They call a PR firm to manage their reputation. Why do they want their reputation managed? So they can maintain their position of wealth, power, and influence. Now, if anybody here works for a PR firm, there's all, all kinds of good reasons for PR firms. Okay, so... The world believes that the influencers, the wise, people with position are the people who matter. But the Bible says that the cross completely turns the world's priorities upside down. God flips the script. He chooses what's low and despised. He chooses the things that are not, which is a way of referring to people as insignificant. People that might as well not exist. People who aren't just names, they're numbers, they're statistics in the eyes of the world. He chooses the insignificant people, things that are not, so that he can render insignificant the ones who are. One person said it this way, God chose the weak not to make them strong, to help them move into the ranks of the upper crust, or to begin a new class struggle, but to subvert, invert, and convert human values. In other words... God deliberately calls many people who are insignificant in the eyes of the world, and He does that for a purpose which is stated in verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So, the, the reason God calls people like that is so that all the people standing around his throne have no reason to boast whatsoever. This is one community that you cannot buy your way into. This is one committee, community that you cannot be born into through a natural birth. This is a community that ought to be different from every other community and society on planet Earth. And God wants to make absolutely sure that all the people are here recognize that there is no room for boasting. To go back to what we were talking about with the polarizing personalities... There's, there's, uh, there's multiple things going on at multiple levels. One of the reasons people would polarize around their favorite leaders or teachers is because there is an internal pride in their hearts. I want to be associated with this kind of person because this kind of person has this kind of status and gives me this kind of place. 
And the Apostle Paul is telling this church, you can't come to the cross and bring your pride with you. Because none of the things that count as currency in our world can be spent here. So God deliberately, and this is why it's humbling, He deliberately chooses the foolish. The weak, the low. So there's no room for boasting. So we've seen the, the kinds of people God calls. The reason God calls those particular kinds of people and finally, I want us to see the purpose of their calling in verses 30 and 31. The Bible says that because of Him, that's referring to God the Father, we are in God the Son. We are in Christ Jesus. And the Bible is using here the language of being in Christ over and over again to describe what we often refer to as union with Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, the Bible tells us that we are united to Christ in such a way that we receive all the benefits that come through that union with Christ. God calls the nobodies of this world into union with Christ. He calls the foolish of this world, at least those whom the world sees as foolish, they're called into union with Christ, and Christ becomes to us the wisdom from God. The Corinthian believers were in love with the wisdom of the day. And Paul is saying, you need to have wisdom redefined. The wisdom that you seek in all these other places is exclusively found in Christ, and it is not all the things that you thought it was. It is described in terms of righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Those are, those are the terms of true wisdom. Jesus was crucified on the cross because you and I aren't righteous. The, the, the requirement for fellowship with God is righteousness. God hates sin. He doesn't even want to look on it. And if we're going to spend eternity with our Creator, then something about us has to change. We need to have a status update. Because we are not righteous. The problem is that we cannot produce a righteousness on our own that is sufficient to atone for our sins. None of us can say, God, I will make this up to you, I promise. You can't. You can't make it up to him. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 tells us this, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That verse is using the language of substitution. Jesus Christ, who knows no sin, commits no sin, has no sin nature, at never, at never at any point has a, sin, has a single sinful thought or inclination, receives the penalty for our sin. He is mistreated. We deserve to be in His place, and yet He steps in our place and takes the punishment that we deserve, but He doesn't just bring us to neutral. He doesn't just bring us to zero. The Bible says that so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So the substitution is Jesus stands in our place and takes the punishment that we deserve and then he hands us his perfect record of righteousness so that we stand before our God, uh, God our creator, with the label righteous, stamped across our account, expunged, wiped clean. The wisdom of God not only gives us this status of righteousness, Jesus also gives us sanctification. Sanctification is righteousness and holiness in our experience. 
You see, when we come to Jesus in faith, we have this substitution, this exchange. We are given the gift of Christ's righteousness, but obviously we are still in our practice, many times sinful. And yet, we are sanctified. We are made holy. We are set apart in Christ Jesus. We are set forward on a trajectory of increasing sanctification and holiness that will arrive at its final destination where our righteousness and practice will be completely aligned with our righteousness and status. Now that's a little bit of something to look forward to, isn't it? The wisdom of God is also explained in terms of redemption. Redemption is deliverance through payment of a price. The background of this term is the freeing of a slave. When a slave was able to save up enough money, that slave could purchase his or her freedom. Or a family member or somebody else could purchase that slave's freedom. It could redeem that slave. We have been redeemed from slavery to sin so that Romans 6 can tell us that we are no longer slaves to it anymore. According to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, this redemption comes through His blood. That is through the cross where He lavishes us with the riches of His grace along with all wisdom and insight as He unites all things to Himself. And so Paul concludes this section by quoting Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 24, which has been the backdrop of this whole section. He says, "...let the one who boasts boast in the Lord." So what he just told us before was there should be no room for human boasting, right? Don't boast. But then he turns around in the next verses and says, but if there is one thing that you are commanded to boast about, the thing that you ought to be boasting about is in Christ. And we should be some of the most braggadocious people in the world when it comes to boasting in Jesus. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14 says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world looks down on the foolish, but they find righteousness in Christ. The world looks down on the weak, but they find their sanctification in Christ. The world looks down on the lower class, but these are the people who are redeemed. So here's where I want to finish. We've been saying that the cross creates unity by calling us to humility. We're going to be honest. Look at it. Our congregation, any other congregation, there aren't many dots. For those of you who are dots, praise God for you. But most of us are generals or CBS 2s. We're the people sitting in the nosebleed section far from the lights and the camera's gaze. And yet the Bible tells us that God delights in pulling generals and CBS 2s from the shadows and giving them a front row seat to the riches of His grace. He delights in taking people that seem totally insignificant to the world, people's lives that don't matter at all, and letting us not only see, but experience the wisdom of the cross. And this ought to do a couple of things for us. The lavish grace of God that we have received ought to humble us. 
Now, I, can't, I cannot press this hard enough. But I'm, we are so proud. And that's a, that's, a, that's a we. We are so proud. You're so proud, you don't realize how proud you are. I'm so proud, I don't realize how deep its roots go. But we are, as a people, are often so incredibly conceited. So I just want to remind you of something. You are not sitting here in this room today because God went down the line ahead of time and marked dot on your ticket. I mean, I hear people say all the time, man, if that person could only become a Christian, think about how much influence they would have. You know, Justin Bieber goes to these... Uh, these things like he's a Christian, no, he's not a Christian, he's a Christian, he's not a Christian. And I've heard people say, man, if Justin Bieber, think about, think about all the people that would be saved. If Justin Bieber is a Christian or becomes a Christian, awesome. But you know what? The gospel's going to do fine without Justin Bieber. <laughs> we don't need celebrity placement for the gospel to be successful because God has always delighted throughout all the centuries and the millennia of calling all kinds of people from darkness to light the people that you would sometimes least expect. So the call for us this morning is to a little bit of humility. No, a lot of humility. You're here because God called you. You believed, you put your faith in Christ, you repented of your sin, but behind all of that is the work of God drawing you to himself. So what do you have to boast about? What do you have to look down on somebody else about? How can we possibly polarize in a congregation like ours? How can that happen? Another application which just grows out of that is that these truths that we've studied today ought to have a profound uniting effect on us. People unite when they're humbled. When they're not measuring each other up, comparing each other, doing all the things that we normally do. When we, have, when we are just to our core profoundly humbled by God's grace, it opens us up to one another. To love one another and not be threatened by one another. To give each other room to grow. To allow someone else in our life to help us grow. But to accomplish what Jesus shed his blood for us, to unite us in him. See, union with Christ isn't just an individual thing. God unites me as an individual to Christ, but in doing so, he unites me to you. And you to me. It ought to have a profound uniting effect on us, and the only boasting, there should be much boasting, but that boasting should be in Christ. We're going to sing about that, and as we boast in Christ, as we sing about that in a few moments, I want us to just blow the roof off of this place, boasting. But I just want to say something to those who may be here this morning, apart from Christ, you are not in Christ. There's probably a couple different categories of people. I'm just several different categories. I'll name two. There are people who come here and think, think, I've got a lot to offer. I just need something else. And the Bible says that you're going to have to humble yourself and admit that everything that you think you have to offer is worth nothing when it comes to Christ. Now that doesn't mean that God does not intend to use the things that you have to offer but when it comes to the saving of your soul or your viability as a Christian, it has nothing to do with what you bring and everything to do with what you get. 
And the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, hey, I've done everything. And Jesus says, sell all that you have. And he's like, eh, I'm out. You've got to come with nothing. <laughs> There's maybe another category of person, and you th- you've come here this morning, and you think, could God care about me? I'm not going to be on the promotional materials. I've got so many problems that we're looking at decades before I ever get it together, if ever, in this life. And I just want you to know that God delights in saving people like you. And you know why I know that? The Bible. But you know why that experientially? Because there's a whole bunch of other people sitting here in exactly the same boat you're in. And so my encouragement to you this morning is to put your faith in Christ. And what that means is you accept what God says about you, that you are not righteous, that you need righteousness from outside of yourself. God is calling you this morning to repent of your sins, to confess your sin as sin before Him, to to reject the direction that you are going, to embrace the direction that Jesus wants to take you, and to admit that apart from Him, you are completely helpless. If you repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ this morning, God plucks you from the shadows to the front row experience the riches of His grace. And you can do that where you're sitting right now. And I'm going to pray for you. Let's pray.